Okay. So, um, yeah, my name is Sarah Heitlinger, and I'm from City University of London, and I'm presenting this talk on behalf of my co-authors, Nick Brian Kins, who is here, and at the back, and Rob Comer. And in this paper, we talk about a study that looked at co-designing Internet of Things, such as networked environmental sensors, and an interactive seed library to support sustainable urban food production. So we've already written about this study elsewhere, um, but what's new in this paper is an analysis of the study through the lens of the right to the city and how it surfaces new ways of thinking about designing for environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive smart cities. The right to the city is a formulation that French philosopher Henri Lefebvre coined in 1968. It's a declaration of a collective intention to struggle against homogenizing planetary urbanization, to democratize urban space and reappropriate the production of space from the dominant hegemonic regimes, which in contemporary cities is neoliberalism. Within neoliberal cities, urban locations are turned into abstract spaces where people are also alienated from nature and from each other. Environmental concerns have driven an interest in sustainable smart cities through the monitoring and optimization of network infrastructures. And civic-minded researchers have started to invoke the right to the smart city over concerns about who these interventions and services are for and who benefits. <clears throat> so you can see how in these typical visions, the production of space is alienated or made strange from the users, or in this case, the inhabitants, and how urban locations are turned into abstract spaces. <clears throat> As Laudato and DiSalvo have argued, smart cities have intensified the effects and reach of neoliberalization. So if we consider the ways in which the physical and the digital are enmeshed in smart cities, then we get hybrid space and we need to consider the production of hybrid space. For example, um, in Apple's new town squares, where communities are encouraged to form around Apple's products in both digital and physical space, raising concerns about the right to the hybrid city. The right to the city maintains <clears throat> that the use value and not its exchange value aspect of urban space must take priority in decisions about how urban space is produced. One of the ways that this can be articulated is in terms of the right to spatial autogestion, which refers to the radical project of people managing space for themselves and refusing to passively accept the existing system of spatial production, one of property rights on which the capitalist economy exists. So when we engage in practices of spatial autogestion, we reappropriate urban space and realize the right to the city by stressing the use value of space over its exchange value and over claims of property and profit. According to Mark Purcell, if we want to participate in the right to the city, then we must identify the sites of struggle, learn to see them, narrate them, and help them proliferate. And he gives the example of the cultivation of urban land as a concrete example to the abstract ideas of the right to the city. Civic-minded researchers are participating in the right to the smart city by working with bottom-up, community-driven, low-cost and local innovative efforts to help citizens appropriate the means of production of hybrid space for themselves. So our work aims to build on these efforts. At the same time, HCI has started to consider the Anthropocene, an era of human-induced environmental crisis, as a way of paying attention to the entanglements of humans and non-humans in thinking about the production of hybrid space and expanding the narrow focus of efficiency within sustainable HCI. Neoliberal smart cities take a human-centered or exceptionalist perspective of cities, in which the human is perceived as a separate, autonomous individual, superior to the non-human, living in a sovereign body whose actions do not have ecological consequences. A perspective in which we understand the implicated nature of human humans and non-humans, though, has important implications for how we think about the right to the sustainable smart city. 
For as Donna Houston and her co-authors have argued, any presumed exclusive human right to the city and the biosphere is increasingly untenable. Connected Seeds and Senses was an 18-month participatory design research project. The project was developed collaboratively with Spitalfield City Farm, an urban agricultural community with whom we had identified opportunities for Internet of Things to support the practices of food growing and seed saving in East London. We focused on seeds as a vehicle to explore the role of Internet of Things in sustainable cities because at the time of the proposal, seeds were a, um, a pressing concern due to proposed EU legislation that would make it mandatory for growers to register seed at, substan at substantial cost and which campaigners claimed would be disastrous to biodiversity and play into the hands of the four global companies that control 60% of all our food supply and also because we've already lost 75% of all our cultivated crop diversity. Our project partner, Spitalfield City Farm, is a charity in East London. Volunteers come and they work in the gardens on, in collective plots, so these are not individual plots, um, and they take home some food at the end of the day. And this, the farm supports um, local Somalian, Zimbabwean, Bengali and Turkish community groups, as well as school children, people with disabilities, and corporate volunteers who come from um, big financial centers as part of their sort of corporate responsibility programs. And so everyone comes and they work together in the gardens. And the farm practices and educates people about organic, low carbon and climate adaptive growing. The farm is located in Tower Hamlets, which is one of the most economically deprived areas in the UK. It is characterized by high population density large-scale immigration, ethnic diversity, poverty, and huge divides between rich and poor. It's also home to Canary Wharf, which is one of the main financial centers of the UK. There are high levels of racial segregation and a range of food-related illnesses. So it's against this background of ethnic diversity, economic deprivation, ill health, and marginalization that we recognized an opportunity to leverage local understandings to explore what sustainable smart cities could be when we employ more democratic and inclusive ways of doing design. So I'm briefly going to describe the co-design process. We started off with a series of creative workshops to better understand the needs, values and practices of small-scale urban growers and seed savers and to work out what kinds of data we might want to collect for our seed library and for the census. And we explored in these creative workshops the cultural, social, environmental, and political entanglements of saving seeds and growing food in the city. And the materials that, we produced in, that were produced in the workshop were used to inform what we call data categories, which relate to both the practical and the personal information about growing and would begin to inform our designs. And then over the 2016 growing season, we worked with 15 seed guardians who were cultural, culturally diverse and grew food from around the world. Seed guardians committed to grow one or two crops for seed and then bring some of those seeds back at the end of the season to the seed library. We also conducted audio interviews with the guardians which were structured around some of those data categories that we'd elicited in the workshops. Seed guardians took photos of their gardens and the, the growing crops um, and the methods for growing. And here you can see someone um, taking the seeds out, as well as the meals that, that, that they cooked from some of the produce that they grow. And these materials um, aim to capture the expert knowledge and skill that's often required to grow these crops successfully in a UK climate. So these are some of the seeds that we got back. Um, and these seeds are highly valued because they've adapted to local climates and they are often of unusual or heritage varieties that are not available in commercial catalogues. At the same time, we built network sensing, environmental sensing kits um, that are typically used in industrial agriculture for increasing efficiency and productivity. 
Um, and these collected information about the temperature and the humidity of the soil and the air, as well as um, light. Um, we created this um, interactive web page that presents the sensor data along a timeline together with the photos and the audio from the garden. So you can explore this, you can explore the different sensors and then you can explore the different gardens. So this is the reproduced this, um, connected seeds library, which was collaboratively envisaged, envisaged from the start of the project as a way of sharing the knowledge from guardians, connecting people to their heritage through food and to make available locally grown seeds. So the way that it works is that you put your um, you put the seed jar on that pad and it starts the slideshow to play of pictures from the gardens and then when you turn that wheel it plays the audio from the guardians talking about um, their experiences of growing those particular crops as well as the more sort of personal and cultural um, stories around growing. Um, so visitors can come and join the library for free and they can take some seeds home and then they're encouraged to bring seeds back at the end of the season in order to maintain the living stock. And the seed library continues to be used as a community resource at its permanent home at Spitalfield City Farm. Um, and so we also produce this website which has the same content as the seed library, so you, um, the images and also the sounds from the garden. So when you take, when you take your seed packets, which you can see in the box there, um, comes with a QR code, and that links to the, the specific website of that particular crop. <clears throat> um, we also held a lot of community engagement events, such as seed swaps, seed-saving workshops, garden visits, and design sessions, in order to build a community of practice, share skills and knowledge, and um, involve people in des design des decisions. At the end of the project, we, um, we, to launch the library, we had an exhibition and a celebratory day of events to the public with talks, workshops, um, etc. And we also produced this book, which you're welcome to come and have a look at afterwards, and a documentary film about the project. So in the paper, we discuss how the study surfaces possibilities for design to participate in the right to the sustainable smart city by contributing to the practices of spatial autogestion in hybrid space through an articulation of designing for biocultural diversity, care, and the commons. We discuss how the right to the city is co-produced among the assemblages of human, non-human, and technological actors as a resistance to the hegemonic narratives of homogeneity and efficiency in sustainable smart cities. Um, and in this presentation, I'm just going to discuss the first one and invite you to read the paper for a discussion of the other two. Urban agricultural communities are what Mark Purcell calls sites of encounter with other people and other species. And the project brought these encounters to the fore. So one of the seed guardians said, I keep the seeds and I keep plants living their whole life for the animal biodiversity. So there's insects coming in and the birds eat the seeds. So there's enough for everyone. By narrating and amplifying these encounters of bioculturally diverse actors, the seed library decenters the human and foregrounds the human and non-human users of urban space. In these ways, it supports the practices of spatial autogestion in hybrid space. Rather than putting a network sensor in the soil to extract data to increase productivity and efficiency for human benefit, in our project, the sensors engage in mutually beneficial relations between humans and other species. So, for example, one seed guardian um, reflected on the sensors and in, could envisage a citywide pollen sensing network that would allow growers to coordinate their plantings to ensure sufficient food for urban pollinating insects, while another reflected on how the sensors consolidated their growing method that involved nourishing the soil. One of the implications for designing for biocultural diversity in the smart city is that we need to stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway urges us. Rather than abstractions and erasures of difference, 
there will need to be compromises and negotiations of complex needs. And we may even have to consider designs that adversely affect humans, such as in this example of street lighting along a cycle path in Bristol that's been turned off to allow glowworms to find their mates. Such negotiations are a necessary part of learning to self-manage hybrid space in the Anthropocene and are a part of the never-ending struggle for the right to the city. So to conclude, in this talk, I have introduced the idea of spatial autogestion in hybrid space, as well as perspectives from the Anthropocene literature in order to envisage what else a sustainable smart city might be when inhabitants manage urban space for themselves in ways that are more socially inclusive and environmentally just. And the message that I want to leave you with is this. Rather than focus on the hegemonic structures of power, it is more productive to spend our energy cultivating the world that we want to live in. So designers wishing to participate in the right to, in the right, participate in the struggle for the right to the sustainable smart city should identify sites where spatial autogestion is already taking place, strengthen and amplify it through design practice, and narrate and share the process through design research, thereby helping the resistance to grow and proliferate. Thank you very much. While you are preparing your questions for Sarah, I would like to, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to pass on to the authors uh, the uh, certificate for an honorable mention that this paper has received. And I would kindly ask you to move towards the middle to m make space for the people who are standing there. So please queue there for questions. And uh, if you're sitting somewhere in the middle, uh, our student volunteers has some uh, notes to give you to write your questions. Is this on? I don't know if this is on. Okay, maybe it is. Uh, Laura Olberg, University of Calgary. Um, I am an avid gardener, and so I identify with this very deeply. I'm really curious if the project is ongoing and if you have plans for sort of the multi-generational nature of seed saving. So the whole idea of, you know, if I go and take a seed planted in my garden, it may or may not cross-pollinate, or I'm participating in this broader idea of seed exchange and seed collecting. Yeah. I mean, so it, we had funding for an 18-month project, which is obviously only enough for one growing season. Um, but what we really want to do is do a bigger project and see what happens over a number of years and how the seed, you know, the stories of the seeds that then go out and come back and the, the generations and the stories of the gardeners. So, yeah, that's something that we would love to do. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dana Habib from Indiana University. Thank hey. you so much for this talk. It was wonderful. Um, so I've got two questions. The first question is, the sensors that you put into the urban environment, how did the um, users and the, the gardeners actually use that data from soil moisture, temperature? Mm -hmm. um, how did, did, they, did they understand it, and how do they use it? The first question. And the second one, with your um, participatory design that you did, what um, knowledge did you generate from that that impacted your, your design outcome? Um, so about the sensor. So in the paper... so. We were slightly skeptical about the ways that they could use the sensor data and the reception. We, we didn't actually manage. What we wanted to do was to have the, the sensor data live and that people could interact with that data as it was coming in, but we didn't manage to do that. So what we've done is created a, a, an interactive web page that has the historical data from the one season. And the, the responses to it has been very diverse. So some people don't engage with it at all, and some people find it really interesting. And so we've got a couple of examples in the paper of how it had, it, the numbers had consolidated their gardening practices. Um, people were highly skeptical of the census as well. They could see that, you know, that the numbers don't kind of add up and so things like that. So there were, there were some interesting responses. To it more than more than we had actually expected, um, and what was the second question? The design process. So how the design process fed into it, mm -hmm. and so how your participatory design that you did yeah. at the beginning. What did you learn from that process that impacted your your design at the end? 
Um, so we'd been, we've been engaged with these communities for a long time. So the whole proposal was co-designed with the community. And then in the workshops, we... Um, so, so as I mentioned, the, the, the way that the, um, the actual seed library works is kind of developed through those workshops and our understanding... So in the paper as well, our understanding of the right to the city in the Anthropocene comes directly from that co-design process. But the design decisions about the actual seed library have been informed from those initial workshops. Thank you. Thank you.